Welcome to the uh, weekly M-Cubed uh, seminar. Today I'm very pleased to, uh, to introduce Andy Heimsfield. Andy Heimsfield uh, got his PhD in 1973 from the University of Chicago. And uh, from 1975 until now, he's been a staff scientist and presently a senior scientist at, uh, at NCAR. Um, and he's been interested in ice phase uh, precipitation since he was about 10 years old, he tells me. <laughs> when there was a forecast of snow overnight in New York City, he used to wake up during the night and watch the snow fall past the street lamps. Uh, from those early beginnings, uh, Andy became one of the leading cloud microphysicists of his generation. He's worked on all aspects of microphysics, you name it, even the absence of cloud in the hole punch uh, cloud. Andy has been active in promoting collaboration across the field. He organized the first international uh, hail workshop in 2018, with another one coming up right in, in, uh, in September this year here at NCAR. He's a fellow of the American Meteorological Society. And by my estimation, he's one of the most productive and uh, highly cited authors in, uh, in atmospheric sciences, with over 275 articles, over 17,000 citations, and each index of 76. Uh, for those of you who know this, these numbers, that they're pretty darn good. And uh, many of these papers are co-authored with his brother, Jerry, who's also an atmospheric scientist. Andy's first project as a junior scientist at NCAR was working on data collected with hail pads during the National Hail Research Exper Experiment. His job was to identify whether hail reported at various sites was real or not. What else could it have been? I mean, were people shooting hail pads or something? No. <laughs> Okay, we'll hear, we'll hear it later. Um, uh, today we benefit from his long experience on the hail phenomena with his seminar entitled Towards Studying Hail Storms, Hail, Hail Storms, and Hail Pole from Past, Current, and Future Studies. Andy? Thanks so much. Glad to be able to do, do this today. And um, so I will be talking about um, hail. And I, I try not to make this extremely technical um, because it might be a mixed group. And so um, I want to just show you some interesting things and relevant. So um, here is, these are um, <clears throat> two recent uh, hailstorms in our area, one was the Denver one, and that caused $2.3 billion in damage. And then the Colorado Springs hailstorm, which also killed animals at the Cheyenne Zoo, um, was $172 million. So in my talk, um, I will briefly talk about where hail is most prevalent, both in the United States and globally, and then some research studies uh, that have been done in the past. And I'll talk about maximum hail size estimates. In other words, uh, when to move your car if there's an impending hailstorm and possible improvements. And then I'll talk briefly about measurements within hailstorms and then summarize my talk. So just kind of a brief summary of what hail is and hail isn't. Um, Basically, you, you, you know what the shape looks like, and it's fairly solid, um, but it has to be, according to AMS Glossary of Meteorology, um, five millimeters or, or larger. And it can be many different shapes. And large hail, uh, Charlie's found this quite a bit, can have lobes. That is, they're not spherical, and it grows by the collection of water drops, and small hail may be indistinguishable from what's called larger graupel. Graupel are like spherical things, but they're, according to this classification, less than five millimeters in diameter. And just kind of some statistics I thought would be interesting. Most of the hail storms, as we know, in the United States occur in four months. And the distribution by month 
is kind of, it, it migrates northward. So in May, it might be more in, this, in the southern part of the US and uh, migrates um, north, northward. And for each of the five years, hailstorm damage has been at least $10 billion, which is just my, a lot. And so um, this shows the uh, hail reports uh, over a fairly long period of time. I'll get to a little more recent update on that in a minute. And so you see much of the hail is kind of east, um, east of us and south of us. And, um, and the largest hail is sort of in that region as well. You see northeast Colorado, if I can point to it here, this little finger here. We get a lot of it, especially northeast of us. And then um, the largest hail is in these regions here. And this shows um, a climatology, and I'll get to this a uh, little more recent stuff in just a moment, um, showing the global distribution of hail. And kind of an interesting one is, you see the Andes here, and obviously mountains have a, a large effect on this, and east of the Rockies. And so that would suggest at least um, quite a bit down here in, in South Africa. And again, mountains play a major role in, uh, in initiating hailstorms. And then um, Europe, of course, um, quite a bit in India too. Again, mountain induced. And the next slide, uh, I want, just wanted to show this recent study using um, the, the GPM, Global Position, Positioning Measurement uh, Satellites, to look at hailstorm detection. And uh, again, you see in the US there's quite a bit in the area I, I showed, but I'm not sure why these, I, I showed this because I, I was confused by it a little bit, because you don't see that large amount of hail uh, in the Andes, or um, move back in the Andes, and other areas which do have quite a bit of hail. So that might need improvements. Uh, so a hail suppression mitigation. Um, I'm, I'm going to migrate on to field programs now and where, what, what the impetus was for much of the hail research to date. So the basic idea is to add more ice nuclei, that is little germs, where um, germs, little aerosols, which are conducive to the formation of ice. And um, if you add a lot more of those, the idea is that you won't get, <clears throat> you, you won't get, uh, each hailstone won't have as much water to condense on it um, because there's a lot of competition for vapor and liquid. So the idea is you add in, and it's pretty, pretty straightforward uh, to have uh, flares or other things and um, that can inject silver iodide. And many of the field projects and scientific studies inhale suppression. And most, most uh, field projects involving hail were conducted in the 1970s and 1980s to test a Russian uh, hypothesis or a Russian allegation that they were mitigating hail due to suppression, uh, hail seat, cloud seeding. And here are the major field programs. And I'm sort of migrating on because I want to show you how few there have been recently. So the Alberta Canadian Hail Project, again, was looking to design and test means for suppressing hail. And it ran for almost 30 years. Um, just uh, on a side note, uh, hail cannons, that is, you uh, project, you, you aim for a hailstorm with a hail cannon. The idea is to blow up the hailstones. That's still in wide use in many places. Um, hail suppression studies in France in, in that period. And then uh, the study in Switzerland was interesting 
because it wasn't really targeting Hale suppression, but Hale research. And Henry and uh, Brent Foote and Charlie Knight were the leads, principals. And so the basic idea was to gain an increased understanding. Oh, that was held, by the way, in northeast Colorado in the Grover area. The idea was to gain an increased understanding of cloud dynamics and microphysics governing uh, severe convective storms that produce hail. And it was patterned, as I said, after the Soviet hail suppression activities. And there were three years where hail suppression component used randomized cloud seeding to test whether there was less um, hail produced in seeded clouds than in non-seeded clouds. And then um, NCAR, again, was organizer of the 1981 COPE study and basically understanding how hail grows in cloud, well, basically precipitation grows in clouds with an emphasis on hail. And um, NCAR led it as well as the Bureau of Reclamation. And then um, there are quite a few South African hail suppression studies in the mid-1980s. Now, a very recent study on hail was uh, Rolampago, and that was in 2018, Argentina. And um, that, was, that was recent, and there, there have been some recent publications about that. Some of the largest hail ever recorded were, was in that location. <clears throat> Again, the Andes. And then I just wanted to highlight Cocorez, that's the bottom one. It's a volunteer network of observers reporting rainfall, snowfall, and hail information. And that's been ongoing for more than 20 years. And that provides some information on hail fall. And that information can be used to improve hail detection by radar. OK, I just wanted to <clears throat> talk about one experiment which we did last summer. And um, it was called Conch. And uh, PIs, um, w me and uh, Adriana Bailey, and EOL, and Jim Bresch. And the um, neat thing about it was we were sort of testing some ideas as well as a prelude to future hail experiments. As I showed you, uh, there have been very, very few studies on hail in the last 40 or 50 years. And um, you see here the co-investigators. I want to kind of highlight two things. One was we used the University of Colorado Raven. And it is a, um, an unmanned aircraft. And it ha has a payload. And I meant to bring down some um, radar chaff. But I will describe it in the next slide. And so that actually uh, <clears throat> flew in the inflow of a hailstorm, a hailstorm in northeast Colorado to test the idea that if you release these tiny little filaments, it's called chaff, and it was used by the military to um, camouflage aircraft. So if you put out a lot of these little tiny little filaments, and it's a little tiny package, then um, radar doesn't know where you are. Well, in the same way, I was testing the idea. We were testing the idea that if we release chaff in the inflow region of a hailstorm, you can actually track the motions because the, the foil um, has very negligible terminal velocity. And so it would carry up with the, with the vertical motions. And the idea was to try to see what the trajectories of hail um, might be like or something like that. And so we did release. Um, we released some, and I have a, a large uh, figure of this, but to make it fit on this view graph of uh, the sli slide, I uh, compressed it. But we, um, this is a convective uh, echo here, and it was released um, in this region here. This is Lyman radar data, and here it is with time. And um, we don't have good altitude information, but you can see it moving with the, with the air. And so in the future, if you have very good radar with being able to um, look at vertical distribution, you can track that. 
And the second thing we were doing was testing in some new instruments to um, provide real-time detection of hail. And these are very, very inexpensive instruments. They're about this large. Hail fall, falls on it, and it causes a, a signal. So each hailstone causes a signal, and it, the signals then of hail are <clears throat> sent to cell phone towers, and then um, wherever they, and then uh, picked up by uh, observers, and or the National Weather Service could. These little things are about $100 each, and so they can pl be placed on rooftops around cities and give real-time warning of hail. So last summer, we were very hopeful to get a lot of hail events. Well, nada, virtually. And uh, so uh, we went out many times to Northeast Colorado, Jim and others, and um, tried to uh, wait with these instruments for hail. And Aaron Bansomer was with them. And so one day, um, Aaron came back here. And guess what? It hailed at NCAR in the parking lot. So here it is. Here, here's the parking lot. <laughs> and it was just one of those lucky things. So Aaron ran out with three of them. And it, uh, and it did give us information on hail occurrence, mass, kinetic energy, and of course, the state parameters. So, um, so these little things, then, it was sort of a proof of concept as well. OK, so I want to move on a little bit now to detection and early warning of hail. And hail can be identified through several radar products. So um, as you saw from that um, image I, a little bit earlier from the Lyman radar, the hail is in regions where there's uh, high reflectivity. And so the left, lower left panel shows the high reflectivity region. And anything above a radar reflectivity of about 40 or 50 um, signifies likelihood of hail. And then if you have a radar which uh, has two polarizations, one this way, the waves move this way, and perpendicular, that's two polarizations. And from that, that also provides quite a bit of information. On, uh, so the hail core in uh, this dual polarization signal appears as a, a near zero um, value. And so uh, that, that will be widely used sometime in the future by an, uh, National Weather Service. Currently, I, um, currently the, I want to just talk about uh, how a radar can provide an early warning system. So the, the maximum estimated size of hail, and it's called MESH, and it's commonly used across the National Weather Service um, to diagnose the expected hail size in thunderstorms and provide a warning system. Now, what I show on, on this panel is the hail kinetic energy flux. So hail kinetic energy basically is mass times the square of the velocity. And the flux is over time. So let's say you have hail kinetic energy in your integrator over a period, then that will give you the flux. And so um, it, it, can, it is an instantaneous product, though. So I just wanted to just show you. It's this curve here. And so here's the radar reflectivity. And according to this algorithm, the um, radar reflectivity, anything above about 40, you start getting a signal. And then you see here it's almost exponential. So uh, very high, ref let's say you have 60 dBZ, this kinetic energy flux or potential damage over a period um, is extremely high. And um, I just wanted to show one equation and that's the top one. And the flux is proportional to z, which is radar reflectivity to the 10th um, power. And um, the w term um, is basically a scaling thing. So anything below 40 dBZ is 0. And anything above about 60 dBZ is 1. So that just gives you a sense. 
And then um, if you integrate the hail kinetic energy flux from the bottom of the hail producing region to the top, then that gives you what's called the severe hail index. And um, I don't want to go into too much detail there other than to say that that is currently in use. I just do want to show you, though, where I'm moving with this. Um, so the derivation of the mesh relationship. It uses relationships developed by the, by the Swiss in the mid-1970s. And um, so what they had were uh, pads, hail pads, and they looked at how many particles <clears throat> were hitting the hail pads and, uh, over time. And uh, they also collected um, hailstones, so it gave number of particles per unit size, which is called size distribution. And what they assumed was that hail is solid ice spheres, and um, they are so round. And so they used uh, a terminal velocity, which was proportional to the square root of a VT, a terminal velocity. And the difficult, well, I'll show you um, now where I'm going to go with this. And so are hailstones spherical ice, and do they fall with that sort of fall speed? So the Insurance Institute for Business and, Safe and Home Safety, uh, Ian Giamanco, they have been measuring, and there are a lot more since 2017, hailstone particle mass. That is, what is their mass compared to their size? And size distributions for storms in Colorado, Kansas, and Oklahoma. And they measured the hail these hailstone properties for almost 3,000 hailstones. And what they also did was they did three-dimensional three scans of particles. That is, they had a scanning apparatus where they could actually quantify how the shape of the hailstone changed with size. So I'd like to now show you, OK, the, these are the three largest hailstones um, found to date. The top one, and Charlie has worked on these, all of these, and uh, the one in Coffeyville, Kansas, was the largest one for quite a while. It had a diameter of almost six inches. The Aurora, Nebraska one is a little more recent, and that had a diameter of seven inch, inches. But you can see it's very non-spherical and very, it would have a very low mass compared to, to its diameter. And then the largest one is Vivian, and that was in 2010, South Dakota, and it had a diameter of eight inches. And I thought I would show you a scale. So this is a, a daughter of someone I know, and there is a 3D print of Vivian, and she's holding it. And so um, I want to go back. So let me just show you how this works. Let's see. If I can do it on this, I can't. Um, anyway, these are 3D scans. Oh, let me see. Let me go back. Here we go. OK. Nope. I can't do it. Anyway, I, I have these in 3D. So if anyone wants to see them, I can show you them. So. Um, so uh, what did we do? We, we took a lot of these hailstones and printed them. And I thought I would show you, and I can even pass these around. So let's see if this is Vivian. OK, here is the Aurora hailstone, a print of it. And um, Simon uh, printed these. And these are held together with magnets. And then this is the inside section of it. Uh, Charlie sectioned them. And then uh, Simon has figured out a way to emboss them on the inside. So I can pass that around. And then this is Vivian. And Vivian is about $500 to print at full weight. 
So what we've done is uh, there's a little hole in it, and it can be filled with water. So it would be the exact weight, almost the exact weight. Or it can be put in a freezer, and um, we can fix it so that it doesn't crack. But uh, then it would be exact weight and like the hailstone. Anyway, so we took many of these to uh, the Mainz Vertical Wind Tunnel, Mainz, Germany, University of Mainz, and we measured the fall speed. And so this is just an example of it. And here is, there is one of them in the Mainz Tunnel. And I have much better pictures, but here we could adjust the term, the air velocity so that we held them constant. And that would give us the terminal velocity. And we did these for many. And so I thought I would just show you. Oh, there it is. Now the next one. Let's see, here we go. OK, so I wanted to compare this Swiss data, the Swiss assumptions on spherosity and terminal velocity, to what we got in the tunnel. So. Um, from Ian's 2,800 hailstones, we could, we could get the ice spherical equivalent spherical ice density. And so those are the dashed lines here. So this is a density of 0 0.91, which the Swiss assume. And this is the actual density of a large number of hailstones. And then in, um, in black, is the assumed terminal velocity, and here's what we measured. And they're lower, of course, because they're not solid ice spheres. And so if you look at the kinetic energy flux and you compare it to the uh, flux that was derived by the Swiss, so this is the ratio of the Swiss held kinetic energy to what we derived from these new relationships. So you see here, it's a back to fact. Oh. Just a minute. Those densities are less because you're averaging in air because you're assuming a spherical diameter. Is that correct? That's right. We're assuming maximum diameter and taking the volume. It's, well, what happens when these melt is that a lot of the water gets collected within, it gets um, collected within the hailstone. So the hailstone. Even, um, even the, this is probably pretty close to solid ice. But if you take its maximum dimension and you take its volume compared to the volume of a sphere, that would give a, sort of a, an, a, a equivalent. But that's really misleading. It is. It is. Yeah. It's not the actual hailstone density, but it's the equivalent spherical density. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, but, but that is the real density. I mean, I should say the real mass. So that should be the mass divided by the spherical mass, approximately. And I think they're pretty, pretty solid. So um, the, my point in showing that was just because the mesh algorithm needs to be redone and um, perhaps um, revisited by the National Weather Service. So what, do we, what, what have we learned a little bit about uh, the <clears throat> inside property, the, the microphysical properties inside of hailstorms? <clears throat> so this is the South Dakota T-28 storm, hailstorm penetrating aircraft. And that flew in Henry, it flew in Cope, and it flew in hailstorms in Europe and in Oklahoma. So there are quite a few measurements from that aircraft. And I just wanted to briefly describe um, a little bit about it. It had lots of instruments on it. And this particular one is a side view of uh, an instrument which measured the size, the maximum dimension of hailstones. And 
it, the, the T20 had gone into reflectivities of about six, as high as 60 dBZ, and many in the 50, 50 to 60 dBZ range. And what, what, just kind of summary is, what we found was that it turned out that the largest tail was on the periphery of the updrafts, not, in, not at least in the cores that were flown by the T28. So perhaps the hail is not growing, and it's not surprising, in the updraft cores, but on the edges of the, of the storms, there's more time for it, for the hailstones, to kind of levitate, like I showed you in the tunnel, and grow. And this is just an example of one hailstone storm it got into, a little bit of uh, uh, damage to certain areas, but they were replaced, and the T-28 flew for more than 25 years. So two things on two more slides. Uh, the Hell Workshops, there have been three in Europe, and Europe, Europe has... European hailstorms are pretty significant as well in Germany and Switzerland, northern Italy. And then we did the, as, um, as was mentioned by Rich, the 2018 North American Hail Workshop. And that, we have a BAMS article on that. And then we're doing one in, in September 20th through 22nd. And I'll show you a little bit about it. So it'll be at Center Green and we will um, follow basically the guidelines that we, or the, um, the flow that we had in our first one, and it'll be hybrid and, and vert, it'll be hybrid. And so anyone who wants to participate in that, you're welcome to attend. And the final slide I want to show here is uh, yesterday we actually submitted a proposal to NSF for a field project. And we call it Ice Chip. And the research themes are things that we don't know enough about. Hailstone development and hail in storms, within storms, and how hail falls. And then in storm hail trajectory trajectories and convective updraft relations and relationships and we'll use chaff to help in that analysis and how does the uh, their environmental impacts on hell processes and predictability and this, the properties of hailstones as they fall to the ground and so we'll have two field programs and it'll be one in 2024 focus on the Front Range in Northeast Colorado, and then a second one in um, South Central Great Plains in that area, which was the Max Hale. And so my final slide is uh, the concluding, what we still know, how, how, how Graupel and Hale forms in a wide range of storms, not just supercells, but other types of, cloud, other types of convective clouds, and we want to calibrate radar to now cast hail kinetic energy. And there are improvements that can be made. What we would love to have, and it's just fallen by the wayside, the T-28 was retired in 1998. A hail penetrating aircraft to measure hail size distributions and if possible their masses in cloud. And one thing that I'm particularly interested in is how hail melts from the zero C temperature level to the ground temperature at the surface, and how that is influenced by the surface height, the relative humidity, and uh, the temperature distribution. And Florida, for example, does not have a lot of hail, and in part, that could be because it's warm, the surface is sea level, it's warm, and the relative humidity is high. And if the relative humidity is low, particles tend to survive longer. And that's it. Thanks, Andy. We have some time for questions here. And I guess, uh, Don? 
I think you could speak to the. Speak to who? Can you speak? Oh, the microphone. Okay. Yeah, I'm curious. Uh, is there any new insight into how hailstones can get so big? Uh, you know, I know I've under, I know some, what they used to kind of think about that, but I still am amazed at how big an occasional hailstone can get. Yeah. Um, well, I was going to show a uh, slide, which I decided not to, which shows basically one circulation up and then down, you know, which is sort of a conventional thinking. Um, the, it, pretty much hail has to, the, the largest hailstones, I think, have to start off at the upwind edge of a hailstorm or even a supercell where there might be some small turrets where the particles can get started. And then they just, it's a very stochastic process. So a couple of stones might have the right hail mass and terminal velocity to kind of sit uh, toward the edges. And we did find with the T28 dead, which I didn't show, that the larger ones are right on the edges where they're growing, where there's liquid water, and they're kind of balanced. But it's such a stochastic process. I was wondering for this uh, field project you have proposed for a couple years from now, what kind of instruments are you bringing to the field? Um, is it primarily a radar-based uh, project? Uh, no, it's going to have the uh, University of Wyoming King Air, and we will be flying that, and we will have the Raven as well. And so we will try to get into as safe regions as possible. And uh, the Raven, well, the the um, King Air will release chaff and probably at aircraft at its level, and then we can try to trace air tra trajectories. Perhaps a related question. Um, you mentioned that it's been since the late 90s since uh, there was a hail penetrating aircraft. So is the primary reason for that that NSF doesn't want to ensure that? Uh, because obviously those aircraft can incur significant amounts of damage, and that is a risk. So what, I guess what do you think are the primary barriers to there being, say, an NSF-sponsored hail-penetrating aircraft? We, we had some picked out. We had, a, hail, we had a, a couple of workshops which tried to identify aircraft that would be suitable and also to get NSF on board. And... That ha so uh, we did identify military aircraft, which would, which would be suitable. Uh, NSF thought about it for a while, and then they dropped it. And now they're thinking about something again. It's been a long time, and there are, there are many improvements in instrumentation. Let's um, well, one over here. Hello. Um, I was wondering what, if it was of interest to look in how to forecast um, accumulating hail cases. There have been some studies which have looked at accumulating hail as well. And uh, there's one ongoing at University of Colorado. And that has uh, look, they have been looking at that as well. And then the observer network, COCORAS, they do record uh, hail depth. So there have been some studies. Uh, hi, Andy. Um, people normally think of hail damage when they look at cars, glass. Uh, but my relatives who live out in the plains, for them, it's crop damage. And totally. So, I mean, <laughs> it's very severe uh, for them. I was just wondering whether you're damage estimates include that kind of uh, effect on crops? They, they do. And um, to emphasize the point about agriculture, Lou Grant, a, uh, who was a professor at um, Colorado State University, had then went into the agriculture business. And what they decided to do was to orient their plots, 
flooded uh, agriculture um, per uh, perpendicular to the, the normal direction of hail. So if a hailstorm hit one area, it would go across, but it wouldn't impact. So uh, the way you put out your crops or organize your crops could be beneficial. Don, any comments? Yeah. Yeah, you talked quite a lot about these uh, hail experiments, in particular the ones that tried to, like uh, Henry, tried to disprove or prove the Russian hypothesis of, I think, close to 100% success. That's what right. Was the, what was the bottom line for Henry? Charlie, you want to comment on it? If you can't, I will. No success. <laughs> no success. And uh, <clears throat> to get back to Rich's um, comment that he made introducing me about hail pads, um, <clears throat> it turned out that uh, there were hail, false hail reports. And uh, these tended to occur on the weekend. The way we, we identified it was by looking at radar imagery over the areas which we thought would, were giving hail indication, but there weren't any echoes. And it turned out, Charlie knows this, that uh, <clears throat> there were students who were manning those um, locations and they were parting. We, we found, identified <laughs> where the parties were. <laughs> so they were, they, were just, they were dancing on top of the hail pads? Or the, the yeah, <laughs> yeah. They were fabricating where, where the, you know, they were putting hail at these locations. OK. <laughs> All right, well, Don asked the question I was going to ask, and so I got the answer. That's, yeah. All right, well. Uh, Zero success. Well, so, not zero, so but the hypothesis was not was yeah, when not, it was not was yeah. not confirmed. That's right. All right. All right. Well, thanks so much, Andy. Thanks again. Yeah. Yeah.